started in a place called Ashurat. Yes, wait. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so then uh, yeah, after that we start renting this place and since then we're here and yeah, we try to convey the Buddhist doctrine in an yeah in an open way. Yeah, so also how we teach the Buddhist teachings here also is not to make people Buddhists, first of all, it's kind of sharing the knowledge we have within uh, Buddhism. And yeah. And the knowledge can be shared, can be practiced in different ways, right? According to our own interests and capacity, so to say. So, yeah, so then we are quite open. And then today and tomorrow morning, we're going to talk about two essential aspects of Buddhism. One is um, compassion and one is reality. Yeah, so that's why it's kind of courageous compassion and ultimate reality. Uh, two important things. Uh, why important? Because it's talks about two principal aspects of Buddhism, first of all, and to accomplish the needs we have as human beings. So we all together here for a particular purpose, yeah, we motivated for a particular purpose, and uh, yeah, one of the main issues why we here, why we look at the spiritual parts is because we are looking for certain things in life, we are looking for things in life, what we call uh, Basically, you can condense it all into two main aims in life. That is wanting happiness and not wanting suffering. Right? So that's in that regard. We're all the same. As soon as we, when we wake up in the morning and there's a headache, slight headache, something like that, then we don't think, oh, nice, right? When the headache comes, so we think, oh, I want to get rid of this. So we want to do something to get rid of the headache or to get rid of the things we don't like. Right? So that's what we means. We don't like suffering. Human beings like to get rid of those things. Yeah? But sometimes we think we're the only one. But uh, that wish for not wanting happiness exists in all of us. Right? So, uh, so innate. It comes automatically. Right? As soon as you have a little bit of difficulty in life, things at all comes to mind. I don't like this. I want to get rid of this. Right? So that's not only something that's only going around in our own mind, that's in all of us. And in the same way, if you have a little bit of happiness, wake up in the morning and you've got a, you had a good dream, a pleasant dream, and there's some happiness there, then you want to keep the happiness, right? You don't want to lose it. So that order, that's another thing in life that we all share, that's one thing happiness. It's a very innate wish as well, so automatically, these things we don't have to think about too much, it just happens to us. Right? So that means we have to, those two aims in life. And according to that, we're going to talk today and tomorrow. Uh, well, from the point of view of a Buddhist perspective, uh, compassion training, as well as reality. Right? But also from the point of view of how that relates to our psychology or to our kind of uh, human state. Yeah, so, yeah, we're going to talk about it. So then, before the talk, then it's always important to motivate oneself correctly. Yeah, so, motivation is a very important aspect of life. Uh, why? Because whatever we do, physically, verbally, or mentally, depends upon our intention, depends upon our kind of uh, motivation, so to say. So, for that purpose, also here now, it's good to motivate yourself in a particular way. And well, we can motivate ourselves to think that we are here for a particular purpose, and that is to change our mind in a particular constructive way to achieve more happiness for self and others. Yeah? So you can think of those lines. And those who consider themselves more inclined in, in Buddhist practice, they can think about you know, all the motivations of achieving nirvana and enlightenment. Oh, Oops! <laughs> yeah, no problem. <laughs> so you can motivate yourself uh, for any purpose, but uh, try to motivate yourself in the correct way to think, uh, kind of, in a constructive way that we hear for those purposes. Yeah, to become a good human being, you can think about it's kind of universal way, or you can think uh, liberation and enlightenment. Yeah, so try to. <coughs> 
motivate yourself in either of those directions. So yeah, and then we do a few prayers together. Uh, you can find in this golden booklet, page number 73. Let's pray to the Buddha, so also that's a reason why we do that, because not, you know, merely because we venerate a particular person or whatsoever, but uh, the Buddha has particular qualifications, right? And those qualifications we aspire to achieve. You know, so there's kind of qualification of bodies, you know, speech, mind, in particular, and the qualifications of loving kindness, compassion, and wisdom. And so that's something we, as uh, yeah, as individuals, sometimes like to uh, praise. And not only that, also because it's all started with the Buddha. Yeah? The Buddhist doctrine is from your country, I can say, to everybody. Um, I'm a foreigner. <laughs> I came to your country in 1990, 1994. Yeah, 1994. And I went to Dhamshala and then came to South India in 1997. So, yeah, I'm, I would say half of my life is kind of Indian Tibetan mixed, and the other half is Western. So, <laughs> yeah. anyway, so then this Buddha also came from your country, so that's maybe uh, nice to do that praise, and after that we do uh, a text called uh, the Heart Sutra, which is the first teaching, one of the, not the first one, but one of the first teachings, so we say, we have signed it as well. Yeah, so we start with page 73. To the founder, the non transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the full destroyer, the complete, perfect, full awakening, the perfect in knowledge, and good conduct, the cigar to know the worlds, being guided in the beings to retain. Teacher of God's in the beings, to you the complete and fully awakened one, down transcend destroyer, the glorious conqueror, and subdue from the psychic land and prostrate the of his own forever. To the founder, down transcend destroyer, the one gone beyond, the full destroyer, the complete, perfect, full awakened being, perfect in knowledge and good conduct, cigar to know the worlds, being guided human beings to be taken. Teacher of God's human beings, to you the complete and fully awakened one. The now transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subdue from the psychic land and prostrate the of his refuge. To the founder, the now transcendent destroyer, the one gone beyond, the full destroyer, the complete, perfect, full awakened being, perfect in knowledge and good conduct, Sagata and over the worlds, being guided by human beings to be tamed, teacher of gods and human beings, to you the complete and fully awakened one, the now transcendent destroyer, the glorious conqueror, the subdue from the psychic land and prostrate the of his refuge. When you're supreme amongst humans, you born out the seven, laid out the seven strides, and that's an supreme in this world. To you, wise and are prostrate. Pure bodies form supremely pure, risen ocean like a golden mountain. Fame that blazes in the three worlds, wind of the best, Lord, to you, prostrate. With a supreme science, placed like a spotless moon, color like gold, to you, prostrate. Thus free like you, the three worlds are not, incomparable wise one, to you, prostrate. The Savior having great compassion, the founder of all our understanding, the field of merit that God is like a vast ocean, to you the one come to dust and are prostrate. The purity that frees from attachment, the virtue that frees from the lower realms, the one part supplying pure reality, the Dharma that pacifies are prostrate. Those who are liberated and show the part of liberation, the only field qualified for realization, who are devoted to the moral precepts, to you the sublime community attending the virtue of prosperity. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Daimaraphi, homage to the Great Sangha, to all three have the vote homage, to all worldly of respect, along with bodies, as many realms in all respects, to bring faith and pay homage, do not commit any non virtuous actions, perform only purely virtuous actions, subdue your mind thoroughly, this is the teaching of the Buddha. The star, a foundation, a flame of a lamp, an illusion, an alcohol, a dew, and a bubble, a dream, a glass of lightning, a cloud, seeking these things as such. Through these merits, may sentient beings attain the rank of all seeing, subdue the cruel faults, and be delivered from the entire ocean, the great bright days of sickness, sickness, and death. I prostrate to our triple gem. 
Just as I heard at one time, the God one of us dwelling in the world. And I hear together the great community of monks and Buddhists for the Sattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration of the Gyaros of phenomena called Amperfection. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Agri Bodhisattva should look upon the very practice of the Amperfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty nature. Then, to the power of the Buddha, the Ganabhashaya Kutra said to Bodhisattva Mahasattva Agri Bodhisattva, how should any son of the lineage who train to practice the activities of the Amperfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Bhagavad said this to the Venga Shariputra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to affect the activities of the five factions of wisdom, should look upon it like this, correctly and repeating, the holding those five factors also as empty in nature. Form is empty, emptiness is form, and is no longer a form, and form is not an emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, composition of factors, and consciousness are empty. Shariputra likewise of the non emptiness without characteristics. Unproduced, unseen statements, not without statement, not fulfilled, not fulfilled. Shariputra, therefore, in emptiness, has no form, no feeling, no consciousness, no factors, no consciousness. No eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visible form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch. No there is no element, not to an, an including a mind element, no consciousness. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance, and so on, and including no aging and death. No Similar, there is no suffering, origination, cessation, and part. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment, and also no attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on the perfection of wisdom. The mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely beyond the world, they reach the end point of the world. All the Buddhas who dwell in three times also manifest complete awakening with unsurpassed, beautiful, complete body. No lies on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, unsurpassed mantra. The mantra truly pacifies all suffering, should be known as the truth, since it's not false. The mantra of perfection of wisdom is equal. Charity Putra is Bodhisattva, Sattva should train in the found perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose from the concentration and commended to the Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya his father, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage is just like that. It is like that when you should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you can do, even that man has rejoice. The Bhagavan having just spoken, the Venerable Charity Putra. The Bodhisattva Mahasattva Arya Abhavid Vasara, meaning that entirely, along with the worlds of gods, humans, and servants and gods, were overjoyed and highly praised by Bhagavan. I proceed to the gathering of the kidneys of the three chakras who abide in the only open human space. By the power of clear points and many illuminations, look at a partition like a mother for a child. By the teachings of the three sublime viewers possessing the power of truth, may in and out of the be transformed, may they be dispelled, may they be dispacified in the world of the soul. May all negative forces opposed to the dawn be completely pacified, may the host of 80,000 also be pacified, and may be separated from problems and harmful conditions to the dharma. Most of the dharma and may be conditions and the short mandala of base number. Piece number 98 on the top. So,
Yeah, so um, to summarize the Buddhist teaching by verse um, yeah, from Arya Nagarjuna, actually Arya Nagarjuna came from South India. So <laughs> it's only Dalai Lama often says that there's many Nalanda scholars who came from South India. And then it's only said, oh, the people there must have a special brain or something. <laughs> because uh, many great masters of the Nalanda tradition, they actually came the land of the coconuts, that's what has been predicted in different texts and uh, many things reference to yeah, areas around here, Nagarjuna Konda and those places. Yeah. So there's a famous quotation uh, within the works of Ali Nagarjuna, he wrote many uh, texts and one text, well, the most popular one, is called Fundamental Wisdom and in that text, chapter number 27, I don't write, where it says this particular verse which Nagarjuna praised the Buddha. So Nagarjuna doesn't praise the Buddha because the Buddha looks so amazing or the Buddha has all these qualifications of his speech or have all these qualifications of his teachings but he praised one particular teaching and the motivation behind that teaching. So then uh, Nagarjuna reads like move out of compassion, you will eliminate wrong views, you teacher of the sublime dharma to go down Buddha, I pay homage. So, it's a very essential aspect of the Buddha that out of compassion, the Buddha started the spiritual path. Right? So he saw, as you know the story, in, in the palace there was a lot of suffering, uh, but even outside there was even more suffering. So he saw the suffering of the people, of birds, sickness, aging, death, you know, then suffering of things, Maybe meeting the things in life you like to meet, and meeting things you don't like to meet, and yeah, never really finding what you're looking for. No satisfaction, so to say. So, <laughs> so the Buddha saw that, and uh, then came to the conclusion that there should be something more in life than just what I'm experiencing now. Right? So that's why he started to follow kind of spiritual path. And this spiritual path led him to a sophisticated kind of thinking process. What are the causes for suffering? And can we do something about it? You know, so that's uh, the Buddha started his spiritual path. Yeah. And then uh, came to the conclusion that uh, suffering is created by the mind. Happiness is created by the mind. Yeah. So we just talked about in the start that we all want happiness, don't like suffering. And both happiness as well as suffering is created by the mind. Or we say Buddhist principles of samsara as well as nirvana also created by the mind. So that means the mind is quite important. Yeah? So we also know that happiness in life doesn't come from the external world. Yeah? People very famous, so wealthy, you know, doesn't pervade to have happiness. Well, people will be very simple if there's contentment and know how to deal with the mind. They can be a lot of happiness, right? So the happiness comes from the mind. Yeah? So the Buddha saw that. So then the Buddha started investigating a bit more. What is actually the cause for happiness and what is the cause for suffering. So then he saw that a lot of our mental attitudes they relate to how we feel. Yeah? Because 
Happiness and suffering is, is mental. Yeah, it's what we call a mental factor. Yeah, that's kind of yeah. So from the Buddhist point of view, we say consciousness is something else than actually the physical brain. Yeah, so there is a relationship between what we call consciousness and brain activity. It's, it's being very it's quite well researched in yeah in many types of research. And one of the most important leading one is then Richard Davidson, one of the neuroscientists with a lot of research regarding the the influence of how we think in brain activity and in particular with uh, meditators yeah. so uh, Buddhist meditators in this regard so he did a lot of research with what they call the Olympic meditators which is kind of a bit strange term because when we think about Olympics we think about breaking the world record physically yeah. but uh, to break a world record with your physical body you can only break the world record with a few split seconds every four years, right? This is not really going to make your thing. Because the body has limitations. But the mind does not have those limitations. So the mind can be developed in a much higher, different, higher state. So meaning can be much more developed. That's been proven in this research. Why? Because they send a few of those uh, Olympic meditators who have about 15 thousand till fifty thousand hours of meditations done which is, you know, if you stretch it out over a few years it's not that much but yeah, uh, constructive thinking over a long period of time so they produce brain activity especially in the, in the sequence of the gamma waves uh, beyond the scale was never measured before in a common human brain so that means it's real more than just Olympic <laughs> aspect of breaking the record was of the scale yeah, so they produce the gamma waves, they, they are very interesting in, in London, I also uh, we had some discussions with some neuroscientists. And, uh, one neuroscientist who also did similar research told me that these kind of high you know, peaks in the gamma waves where the ordinary person has scored maybe 80 or 90 at the, at the most, but they are be beyond 100 for these meditators. So it means there's no grasping at kind of destructive emotions, as we say. Yes. Like the flow of coming and going. You know, so, uh, same thing can be proven with uh, Paul Eggman, who did some research, a lot of research regarding facial expressions. And then it's saw, like Pim pointed out, 10,000 different muscular differences in the face of how we look and how that uh, the relationship with our emotional life, positive and negative. So he did research all over the globe, even in, in rainforests with very isolated uh, uh, groups of people. And then when he met with his Holy Dalai Lama, he said, after he had seen so many faces, he said, I've never seen a face like that before. So it was very similar with Olympic meditators who saw brain activity was off the scale. Right? So that means uh, what uh, Paul Eggman said regarding the facial expressions in his holiness is that there's no grasping to emotions. When you talk about something difficult, you know, like the case in Tibet or some other aspects of, of, of difficulty in the communities or whatever, there's a little change, but straight away there's a laughter. There's no grasping to difficulties in life. You know? So that's very interesting to see. Yeah, so uh, this, this neuroscientist in, uh, based in London, she told me that it's like drawing on a river. Right? If there's an emotion, you can read a drawing, but then it's gone. You see that? So that represents more or less this gamma high, high fre frequency or high score in the gamma waves. You know? So that's been present by these kind of meditators. So that's, that's very inspiring. So then, back to the story of the Buddha. Then uh, the Buddha saw, okay, the cause for these types of what we call suffering is rooted in something. It cannot just, nothing is random. So, uh, we know that uh, when I was a university student in the Netherlands, uh, before I became you know, dressed up like this, <laughs> I was also just a normal student, and, uh, and going to parties, and you know, what normal people do in life, right? You, you try to enjoy your life as best you can. <laughs> so, uh, we tried to do that, but then they called quite some questions. I was about 20. You know, so, that, what is the meaning of life? Uh, why are some people suffering more than others? There's a reason, right? And what's the purpose? You know? So those reasons, because it's, it's not random, so there should be causes for that or conditions. Right? So that, uh, 
you look and you check that how but we know most of you know also that things happiness and suffering comes from within right it's a mental attitude so the Buddha also came to that same conclusion, but a little bit more profound, and said two things. He said, the direct cause of suffering, right, is are these destructive emotions, are these afflictions like anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, you know? and then modern afflictions like also in India, I suppose it's yeah, it's, yeah, it's also it's in the West, it's very evident for the last decade, fear and anxiety, you know? those kind of destructive emotions. You know? There's a direct cause for suffering. That's one thing, a direct cause. But the Buddha also saw there's something rooted in these destructive emotions, which actually is a fuel for these destructive emotions to become more, to become stronger. Yeah? So that's what we classify as ignorance. Yeah? So direct cause are, the, are these kind of destructive emotions, and the root cause is this ignorance. So that we're going to talk about uh, today, tomorrow. So. Then the Buddha said, or Nagarjuna in his praise said, moved out of compassion. Right? So then the Buddha saw the suffering, what he just classified as birth, sickness, aging, death. Yeah? And then the other three of not wanting the things you like to want, yeah, you like to meet in life, and meeting things you don't like to meet in life. Right? So we have all those things in life. We have to do things, but actually we don't like to do those things. Or we, we like to do things, but we cannot do those things, right? So that's, that's quite evident in most of our lives. And then the, after that is one that you never find what you're looking for. Yeah, no satisfaction. Actually, those two lines. Also, some Western pop, pop groups like Rolling Stones and U2 came to similar conclusions. Because Rolling Stones said, I cannot get, I, I, I cannot get satisfaction. And U2 said, I haven't found what I'm looking for. Out here. So you can see there's a kind of search, but there's no nothing to be found. Yeah. If you look at outside, yeah, there was even a, a Dutch a group. Uh, yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I won't tell you all the details, but it was also a Dutch a pop group where I listened to a lot when I was young. But at that time, I didn't understand really what they were talking about. You know, so they had one a lyric that says like, um, what did it say? Is this all us? It means, is this everything? Very interesting. Only after I became a Buddhist, I started to realize what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah, it's very, it's very to the point. Yeah. So, that means that Buddha came to the same conclusion. So then, what is then the real cause for happiness? Right? So, and not only happiness for oneself, but then the Buddha generated this compassion. Because we, based on the logic we just discussed, all wanting happiness, not wanting suffering, so the Buddha generated this kind of idea, how wonderful it would be, seeing the cause of suffering, that I can eliminate the suffering of others. Right? So compassion we define as a wish for others to be free of suffering. It's compassion, generally speaking. Uh, so yeah, the Buddha came to that conclusion. The another thing the Buddha came, that's with regard to suffering. With happiness, also the Buddha said, oh, I like happiness, so how wonderful would be if all sentient beings may always abide in happiness. And that's how we define love and kindness. Yeah, so love and kindness is a wish for beings to abide in happiness. Right? Compassion is a wish for others to be free of suffering. So there's two things, yeah? love and kindness and compassion. Yeah, so, and that's those two actually accomplish the two aims of, of, of beings in, 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 in samsara. Because we all want happiness. Don't like suffering, right? So we all want happiness. We try to accomplish with generating more love and kindness, right? And all don't like suffering, we try to generate with compassion. Yeah, so the Buddha came to that conclusion. So that's why it says, moved out of compassion. Yeah, that's the first line of the human phrase. Then the second line, you will eliminate wrong views. So the Buddha didn't, uh, was not into politics. <laughs> and said, oh, you wrong, I'm right, you know, not like that. He didn't refute individuals. He only refutes wrong states of consciousness or misunderstanding of reality. So, yeah, so that's what that says, now that you, mean. you will eliminate wrong views. Meaning the Buddha checked and saw that how things appear to our mind is not always reality. But we believe it's reality. Right? 
So that's true for attachment, that's true for anger, that's true for all the destructive emotions, and even more true for anxiety and fear. People have this anxiety, don't look, go out, I have to go out because this and this will happen to them. Right? They think like that. But it's not reality. But they believe it's true. That's the problem. So if you don't believe in reality, or don't understand reality better, then you can create a lot of problems. So, uh, that being the case, the Buddha taught this view of interdependence, of the view of dependent origination. So, the problem is, we believe those destructive emotions that actually are the cause for suffering, direct cause for suffering, that's one problem. The other problem is, we believe they are correct. We believe they are true. Yeah? For example, uh, two main afflictions, attachment and anger. You know? So a person you dislike in life, you yeah, have aversion to it, to generate anger or a situation. Let's say that person has, let's say, 60% faults and 40% qualities, right? Because nobody, there's no plus person on this planet who has not even one quality, right? So <laughs> we all have kind of potentials in our mind. Yeah? So, so let's take that person person you dislike, 60% is like faults and 40% qualities. When you get angry at that person, you don't see those 40% of the qualities. You don't like to. Even if not a person tells you, no, no, because this person is this well, this well, you say, no, no, not true, right? So that means that mind of anger is not in accordance with reality. You see that? So the same true with attachment, our chocolate cake, I mean, here we take it straight away, but if you get yeah, this, you know, you can order these kind of things on the, online, right? So I remember, I was with one of my friends, also who comes here to teach, I don't say his name, but you know, well, it's also you order pizza, because he said, now I'm like, look, now we have this app, we can order, I said, okay, order. So then we looked at the picture, and then you see a pizza being, you know, photographed. And if you like pizza a lot, you generate attachments, right? Or chocolate cake, or whatsoever. So then, the pizza has also like 60% qualities and 40% faults, right? So faults meaning if you eat too much, you get, your stomach gets upset or, you know, when it's not that tasty as, as expected, then, you know. <laughs> so then you order it and then you don't see this 40%. You only see the 60 and you think the 60 is actually 80 or 90, right? Yeah, so, so it means you only believe in the qualities. Then when it's delivered, it's not the same as the picture. <laughs> It's not as hot as you expected, and the taste is not the same as you expected, because you didn't see that before. And then there's no satisfaction, you see that? That's, that's, the, that's the problem with attachment, is that we overestimate the qualities, don't like to see the faults. And then when that object is met, we see the reality of it, and there's no satisfaction, right? You see? So that's why, uh, yeah, many things in... in uh, yeah. So, but the problem is we believe in those afflictions, and that makes it kind of complicated. We believe that person has 90% only faults, right? instead of only 60, but we believe so. So some even uh, psychologists, they come to conclusions that 90 to 80% of what a person perceives when a person is angry is kind of mentally fabricated, is not reality, you see? So that's why the Buddha said those destructive emotions are not in concert with reality. So it's the, the faults of destructive emotions. Yeah. And they are rooted in this misunderstanding of reality. Yeah? So, uh, the problem is, whatever appears to our mind is not always, always reality, but we believe it's reality. That's the problem. Like a dream consciousness, when you wake up after the dream and you're still a bit disturbed, the dream is not a nice one, <laughs> then, you, then you, also, you take some water and it takes you some time to, to, you know, to get back to the waking state. And you still believe a little bit it's true or not, like spirit dream or something. So in the dream, you 100% believe it's reality. In the BBC, in the, on the BBC News, uh, was in the UK, there was a lady who has a very expensive ring you know, finger, like a, a ring on her finger from, from hiding from her marriage, like gold with, with diamond. So she was so attached to that and so afraid to lose it that she was dreaming, she was on the train, and it was a robbery, and she was so afraid that the thieves will take her ring. So what she did in the dream, she took it and swallowed it, you know, to protect 
very interesting. So to believe it was reality. Then as you woke up in the morning and then said, oh, there's a strange dream. You looked at her <laughs> and the ring was not there. Then she remembered the dream and thought, oh, oh. So then she went to the hospital and they made a photograph and the ring was actually in the stomach. <laughs> so that means that sometimes we believe it's real, but it's not, right? So yeah, that's, that's kind of an issue. This, this ring thing is easy because you have operation, you get it out, and that's it, right? But the destructive emotions are a little bit more complex. Yeah? So, uh, because they're rooted in misunderstanding of reality. And well, a misunderstanding of what we just called ignorance, right? So, ignorance that believes in a reality that is not reality, but it appears in the way and we, we take it for granted. Yeah, that things appear from their own side, what we classify, inherently. We think, our body, our mind, the things around us, it all appears from its own side, without dependence. Yeah, things seem to exist without dependence, all by itself. And my problem, so difficult, I cannot change. You see, it's very inherent, yeah, without dependence. Or my car, or my phone, or my laptop, or my this, my that. You know, so it's all rooted in a very concrete concept of I and mine. All afflictions are rooted in it. So, then the Buddha says, this is what we call ignorance. <laughs> to, <laughs> to tell you another story, because sometimes people like stories. But, uh, yeah, when I was a young child, I was like this, this high, I think, maybe 10 or 11, then um, I was very uptight personality, very uh, angry. He's getting very angry. So, what happened when I was a child, in <laughs> many, many occasions I got very, very angry, but I'll tell you just one. You know. <laughs> so, just like we, uh, I was with my parents and we went to Switzerland. And Switzerland is a kind of, uh, because, yeah, my, my aunt was living there and uh, we went there in, in fall mostly. So, that period in October with the nice mountains. They have different colors, you know, the, the leaves. You know, the snowy mountains and blue skies. So very nice for walks. But anyway, I was very young and then I didn't realize that it was very nice. But <laughs> So uh, then we went to this fancy restaurant. And uh, in this fancy restaurant, they don't have dishes we have in the Netherlands, the favorite ones. And if you're 10 or 11 year, years old, you're not interested in fancy kind of menus, right? You only want, like, for a Dutch person, like, fish. No, not fish, chips, chips, chips and mayonnaise. Right? And there's a kind of famous sausage called frikandel in, in the Netherlands. At that time I was not a vegetarian yet, only became vegetarian later on. But, so then, there's the only thing I, I, I wanted to have. So I was so angry that I just put my fist on the table and said, I don't like this. And then you, you know, I need this Dutch food, you know. But it was not possible, right? But then you can see that I came up and took over. I want this, I don't have. So out of attachment, not being able to meet the object of attachment is Dutch particular food, right? Then there's, because you, you separate it from your object of attachment, so that's unpleasant, right? And we don't like suffering, and we like happiness, so because of that unpleasant feeling, we get irritated, you see? So that means that out of this eye that comes up, you know, this irritation comes. So it's rooted in the eye. There's many other examples if I tell you all, please get angry everybody, come on, get angry. It's very difficult, right? People start to put a smile on their face. <laughs> so, you know, ask you, please get angry, then it's difficult. But if they say, oh, you look like this, your hair is like that, and you behave like this and that, then you get irritated, and then within a few split seconds, you can check it. So easy. You see that? So that means it's rooted in this I, you know, this concept of self-importance, uh, self-centeredness. And it's not only a Buddhist thing, even in many types of research, we found that this concept of I is, is a problem, self-centeredness. They don't say I as we describe it in Buddhist philosophy, but they say this self-centeredness is an issue. So it is this research at Harvard Medical School of, of having conversation with the individuals and you calculate how many times in 10-15 minutes conversation they say I mean myself, right? So, if you study linguistics, you know that whatever we express relates with our emotional life, right? how we use our language. 
there's a correlation between the two. So, in this research, very interesting, people with a very high score in, in self-centered uh, verbalization of self-centered related words, I, me, myself, right? They look at health records and physical and mental health also seems to be correlation there. People with uh, more self-concern, more self-centeredness, basically have more depression, uh, lower, low self-esteem, high blood pressure, inclination to heart diseases, very interesting. So that's not only the Buddha taught this 2,500 years ago, but also in modern types of research, they come to similar conclusions. So then we see from a subjective, from a subjective point of view, from our own experience, when the eye comes up, it's very easy to get angry, right? Right? Yeah, you see that? Yeah. So it is kind of a subjective kind of thing, of our own personal kind of uh, understanding, right? In a similar way, this research regarding physical and mental health comes to similar conclusions. And it goes even to the extent of business that uh, there's a kind of company, I mean, this is a very successful one, uh, called the Potential Project. Well, two of my friends, they work for that company. I mean, company is a big word, but <laughs> for that organization, I should say. So they train about 400 different other companies in, in leadership, yeah, including CEOs of, of Google and uh, many world leading kind of organizations. So this, 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 this did research in, in combination with Harvard. And then the research was focused upon 35,000 leaders, right? including a few dozens of, of, of CEOs of world-leading organizations, Microsoft, etc. So the big research. And it is a book, it's called, it's called The Mind of a Leader. It's published by Harvard uh, Business Review Publications. So it's kind of, uh, you know, maybe, yeah. It's not just one of the corner of the street. <laughs> so anyway, so they came to three most important things for, for a leader to be successful in the company. Right? So that means the leader should be mindful. Right? That means the leader should be aware of emotional life of self and others. And be attentive and, and know how to act and be concentrated. Right? There's a few aspects uh, of mindfulness. Then, the second one, he should be selfless. Right? Because if, if he's very egocentric, if the person only thinks about himself, then the teamwork or the team spirit is not really going to happen, right? So that's number two. And number three is, if you believe it or not, it's compassion. Very interesting. If you understand the people you have to work with, you have to understand their difficulties, then you can do so much more as a team, right? Very interesting. So, yeah, from many angles, you actually can prove that these kind of things in life are benefit, right? on the individual level, but also on the social uh, level as such. Um, yeah, so that's a few things. So then back to the teaching of Buddha, because all it originated, actually the two friends of mine, they are Buddhists, who work for this uh, potential project, a few actually, uh, mo the majority are uh, very successful people, but uh, they are also Buddhist principles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very interesting stories. Using, using Buddhist principles, you know, to, to help in this way. And this scientifically, you can prove the benefits, right? So, it's very interesting. Yeah, just to tell you, because the Buddha came from your country, not my country, so that's why you are the Indians, right? So, you should know that these kind of authentic teachings came from your country. and can be of so much benefit to individuals and society at large. As I went to a talk at Interfaith, uh, meeting just before I came here, and the same thing, I told him, you know, people from the Christian background, uh, people from the Islam, people from uh, Hindu traditions, it's true, you know, it's thanks to India, I think, to be honest, all these kind of positive states of the mind, they came from this country, from the different religions and different forms of faith, so that can bring great benefit to, uh, not only India itself, but to society at large, on a global level, you know, it's really true. Because most of these types of research we see is based on principal aspects of mind training of these kind of things of your, your heritage. Right? So it's very interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, to go back to the Buddha. So then he came to this conclusion that things don't exist the way they appear. Right? So we went to that. Yeah. So he saw there is suffering, and the cause of suffering are these destructive emotions. Right? So because when a destructive emotion comes up, there's an unpleasant feeling. 
and then we say something not pleasant to another person, and then we harm the other person, and then just a few minutes of irritation can cause hours of, 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 of you know, misunderstanding or uncomfortable feeling, right? Because you go home and you think about, oh, I did something wrong, and the person you said something to, towards to, that person thinks, why did the person say this to me? You know? So for a few hours, both individuals or whoever was involved can have kind of an issue or losing you know, sleep or kind of uh, uh, appetite. You know? so, yeah, a lot of problems arise from these kind of uh, destructive emotions, right? So that's quite evident. Yeah. So then the Buddha said we have to do something about this. Yeah. So uh, the Buddha generated a kind of compassion for sentient beings in order to release sentient beings from their suffering. Yeah, so compassion as we just defined it as a wish for all sentient beings to be free of suffering, right? And that's one aspect of compassion. But compassion goes a step, one step further. Compassion is, is kind of, yeah, there's different levels. You can say how wonderful it would be if all sentient beings were free of suffering, first level. The second level, may they be free of suffering. And the third level is, I will cause them to be free of suffering, you see? So there's different levels of compassion. And then the Buddha generated all three in sequence and then came to the third one. So, if you have a compassion, a wish for others to be free of suffering, it's a very constructive way of thinking. So constructive that it's been, you know, even the same thing again, it's been well researched, even Stanford University in the, in the US, uh, for example, which is designed together with the Chimpa, a whole kind of way of training in compassion for, for you know, to produce a kind of a person who has more contentment in life, more happiness in life. Very interesting. Yeah. So, and so it's all based on the same principles. So this compassion of wanting us to be free of suffering, and you're going to do something about it. That's a very constructive way of compassion. One of my friends, uh, I met once in a conference here in Bangalore, uh, she, she did some research in Eggman, actually the daughter of Paul Eggman, I just mentioned Paul Eggman for a So his daughter is into healthcare and, and, and psychology, so she did some research of empathy versus compassion in the healthcare. Very interesting. And then uh, she came to the conclusion that if you have empathy, which is defined as a mind that feels the suffering of others. Right? It's kind of uh, you feel that other people are in difficulty. But that's it. It doesn't go a step further. Right? So C saw that if you only have this empathy, it, it causes uh, stress or burnout, uh, you know, and difficulty in life. Right? And if you try to move towards constructive thinking of I can do something about it, then it's a much more constructive way of, of thinking about problems. And so that's why this compassion goes a step further, right? So compassion goes a step further, not only sees the suffering of others, but want to do something about it. Right? So then, uh, if you can do something about it, of course, you should do so. If not, then you should, you should try to generate a kind of yeah, kind of a t intention to do it in the future, right? So you can generate that in the future. So then, can make a prayer, you know, for, or intention. Okay, I can do it now, but in the future, I hope to be able to do more. Yeah, so that's kind of a constructive way of thinking, of generating compassion. Yeah. So that's what the Buddha said uh, to try to liberate the suffering of sentient beings. So then, compassion has many levels, as we just said. You know, the compassion by how wonderful it will be. May they be free of suffering, and I will cause them to be free of suffering, right? So, but also, the more you understand of this aspect of for them to be free of suffering, right? It says all sentient beings, may they be free of suffering. So if you understand what suffering is all about, then your intention becomes much stronger, right? So that's why you have to understand what is suffering. You know? So we just talked about a few things of suffering, about that the destructive emotions cause our physical and verbal activities, and if you do something negative, then, uh, yeah, it has negative results, right? Yeah. Like a person who commits a crime of murder, 
is basically because there's a destructive emotion that takes over, there's kind of emotional hijack, the person is not in control and makes a mistake. Right? So one of my friends in central prison, uh, still going? No, no, stop, no, I think. Stop. He used to go to the central prison for quite some time. And uh, there was also one person who was there for murder. And I use this example quite often, <laughs> often in talks because it's, it's, very, it's very kind of true. You know, that he, he told me, he said for 10, 15 minutes I was not in control, anger took over, and I made a mistake, I killed all the human being. He's a very nice person to talk to. Not the time of a bad person at all. But he just committed this crime. And now he's in prison for I think 12 or 13 years. So that means that you can see, even on that level, the cause was mental, right? Initially. It's a mental attitude. So then, if there's no control, then there's this emotional hijack, and the people commit an act, right? So, so the Buddha also came to that conclusion. And then, the wish for others to be free of suffering, this compassion, so to say, yeah, where we just discussed the three levels of how wonderful, right? If they be free of suffering, may they be free of suffering, and how to cause them to be free of suffering. Yeah, the, the third one is a much more constructive way of thinking. So, uh, yeah. But also, to understand that suffering, as I just said, is also very essential. Because if you have a problem in life, and, you know, you solve that problem with depression, physical issue and it's much easier for you to help others who have the same kind of problem, right? Because you experience it. So here same thing. So the Buddha said you should know suffering. You know, when the Buddha talks in your country, the first teachings in, in Sarnath, uh, you know, where he taught the first turning of the wheel in Sarnath near Varanasi, the first sentence he taught was you should know suffering. Very interesting. Sentence. So, uh, some people think, oh, the Buddhists, especially in the West, <laughs> some people say, oh, the Buddhists, they only think about suffering and impermanence, they must be so unhappy, they must be so depressed. But uh, actually, it's probably not true because if you understand reality, then you can do something about it, and then uh, the opposite is true, right? So, to prove that <laughs> yeah, that's true, you can see some Zaibana, and you can see that seems to be a very happy human being there. Yeah. Or even some of the hippies in Dharamsala, they came to that conclusion. They, <laughs> they had their parties in Baksu. I don't know people in Dharamsala, but there's a place in Baksu where, you know, this kind of lost hippies, because it's, yeah, it's past hippie time, it's over. <laughs> but anyway, it's still at the same time. So they have these parties all night long with drugs and all the stuff and everything. You know, but then they're still not 100% satisfied. Right? Because otherwise they would just keep doing that and not looking for something else. Right? That's the thing. If you find something in life that is, is the real cause for happiness, the more you do it, the happier you should become. But that's not the case. So these hippies... <laughs> I was once in that scene when I was young. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I a lot of it. So they were in this scene of you know, all nylon part, it's sort of drugs and all the stuff. And then they met with this holiness and said, Oh, look at that. <laughs> they said, look at that, you know, this person doesn't go to parties, he doesn't drink, he doesn't use drugs, but look, he looks to be, he seems to be such a happy human being, right? So that's a thing that doesn't come from, that comes from the mind, from the mind training, you know, so, also the, the hippies, they realize that, you know, I mean, those, not all hippies, have realized that, but, uh, yeah, those that realize that. So, that means that, if you understand suffering, that's why the Buddha taught it. You know? Because then you can do something about it. If you have an addiction, same thing. If you have an addiction, I don't know here, but same thing, I think, with buying cigarettes. It's like a photograph of the lungs with full of cancer. I think same thing in India these days, right? So, photograph is this big, you know? Huh? <laughs> yeah. I was in London and I went to do some shopping one day, and uh, then I saw that. I thought, oh, I didn't realize that before, you know? Like, that they advertise like that. In the early days, when I was young, it was just letters, but no photographs. So they had this incredible photograph. So then, but if a person who smokes and sees that, say, like, well, no good. And then smokes, then nothing will happen, right? But if that person is really thinking about, oh, there are lungs and there's cancer, if 
stress mode can happen to me as well. If the person doesn't think about it, then he will not be influenced, right? But if the person really starts to think with an addiction, whatever it is, then the person will try to change it, right? Let's so that people smoke. Huh? Let's take people smoke. Yeah, exactly. Because they don't reason it. They see it and they should reason. On the plane, they think, or is it or not? I have that impact. Of course, it has some impact influences, but not as strong as it should be, right? So this is with all addiction, same thing. If you understand the faults of the addiction, it's easier to go against it, right? Yeah. So, uh, that's true for the destructive emotions as well. If you generate, you know, destructive emotions, seeing the faults of destructive emotions, you will apply antidotes, right? But if you don't do that, then you're just always in this kind of state of, of not really improving. Right? So that's why, that's why the Buddha said, you should know suffering, just to wake us up out of our, you know, ignorant dream about life is just like nothing else than the daily things we do. Right? So that's why the Buddha said you should know suffering. Yeah? So with you should know suffering by saying that aspect that Buddha said uh, the first teaching. The second teaching he said you should abandon the cause of suffering. It's very logical, right? You should understand suffering, you should know suffering, the Buddha said, and you should abandon the cause of suffering. So, if you know the cause of suffering, and you abandon that, suffering will not come into being, right? Very logical. So that's why we should know suffering, in order to know suffering, the cause, and then abandon it. So, that's uh, the teaching number two. Then, the third one, the Buddha said, you should manifest the true cessation. True cessation meaning... Oops, there's a true cessation right there. Here. So, what did I say? Yeah, sensation. Yeah, so, good. Thanks for the phone call. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. so, the truth of cessation, number three. Yeah. So, that means that uh, an absence of suffering, that's what truth of, truth of cessation is all about. Yeah. So, we have a kind of uh, mind that can be free of destructive emotions. Right? So, that's very important to know in order to manifest it. Yeah. So the Buddha said, uh, afflictions or destructive emotions are not an innate part of our mind. Right? So here luckily, uh, quite a good climate, the place where I live now, London, is a lot of overcast. <laughs> you know, so that means you don't see the blue sky that often as you see in, in Bangalore. Right? With the smog and all, so it's not as it's in Delhi luckily here, but you know, certain big cities, as you know, in Delhi, you don't even see the sun during uh, daytime with no clouds, because it's not getting right. So, but, uh, the clouds, so to say, uh, meant to, not, uh, the clouds are not in any part of the blue sky, right? Because if you go above, there's still blue sky. So, the, the clouds are never part of the blue sky. They just obscure the blue sky. So in the same way, our destructive emotions, anger, attachment, jealousy, pride, you know, fear, anxiety, all those kind of destructive emotions, they're just temporarily there. They come to the power of certain causes and conditions. They abide and disintegrate, right? They're not always present. Yeah. So also now, when I ask you, please get angry, everybody, then people put up a smile on their face instead of getting angry. So that's a sign that uh, anger is not present at the moment, right? So that means they're not in any part of our, our you know, consciousness. They just temporarily come up because of constant conditions. So that's very important to know that uh, those afflictions. So the destructive emotions, you know, uh, they have many faults, as we normally contemplate. But they have one incredible quality, and that is you can take them away. You know, 
So that's a very good quality. You know? So that means, why do we can't take them away? Because they're not in a part of the mind, right? They're not always present. Yeah? They're momentarily changing, right? They depend on cause and conditions to become manifest, to become either stronger or weaker. They depend on many cause and conditions. So that means they base, yeah, they depend on cause and conditions, right? So that's also another aspect. That's now aspect number two, you can say, right? So there's one aspect you know in it, part of the mind, they just yeah, momentarily changing. Right? And then the third aspect is they're not in accordance with reality. Yeah? So we just discussed that. For high percentage, they just like to see one aspect of reality more than the other aspect. Right? So that means that uh, yeah, they're not in accordance with reality. So that means if you have a correct form of understanding reality, you can eliminate it. Same as a dream, if you wake up and the mind is still disturbed, you take some water and you think, oh, it's just a dream, relax, you know, I'm here, nothing happened. You know? So it takes you some time to reason and to get rid of that feeling, right? So that means there's this possibility of seeing that there was incorrect form of consciousness and with the correct form of consciousness, you can eliminate the wrong form of consciousness, right? So the same example applies with, with the train example when you think you're moving but actually it's the other train that's moving you know the feeling? So the moment you look at the platform you know it's the other train, not my train. So as soon as you see the platform you reason, come to a conclusion you don't believe it anymore that you are moving. You see that? So with the correct form of understanding reality we can eliminate incorrect forms of consciousness. So meaning also these destructive emotions, right? So, and also understanding reality well, those destructive emotions will lose their potential. Yeah. So if you really contemplate that the person you get angry at also has qualities, then it will reduce the anger. Right? The more you, you, you contemplate the faults of your object of attachment when the pizza is delivered, then you know it's probably not according to, <laughs> to what you saw on, on the picture, right? So your attachment will also not be too strong because you understand that aspect, you see? So the more you understand reality, you will reduce these kind of destructive emotions. Yeah, so that's uh, one thing. So then the Buddha, the Buddha said you should know suffering, right? You should uh, abandon the cause of suffering and you should manifest the true cessation. Yeah? That's all we are. So, if you see the possibility of eliminating these destructive emotions as we just discussed, then it makes sense to think we should manifest in the near future these aspects of the mind that is separated from afflictions. Yeah. When we talk about nirvana, nirvana is being defined as a state beyond afflictions, a state beyond any type of suffering, any type of the cause of suffering. That's how we define nirvana. Yeah, so there's a state that's kind of the ultimate cessation. Right? So uh, that means that state can be accomplished by training the mind in a kind of constructive way. Yeah? And by training the mind in a constructive way, we can eliminate more and more afflictions and achieve the state of nirvana without any affliction anymore, full stop. Why? Because the afflictions are not in a part of the mind, right? They're momentarily changing, they depend on causes and conditions, so can be changed. And they're not in forms of reality, so with correct forms of consciousness, we can take them away. You see that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So then, uh, an even more precise aspect of the true cessation is understanding, you know, we talked about direct cause of suffering and root cause of suffering, remember? Yes. So direct cause of suffering are the Afflictions, yeah. destructive emotions. But the root cause of suffering is ignorance. Yeah, very good, very attentive. I like that. <laughs> yeah. So the root cause is ignorance. You know. So what is ignorance? We didn't we didn't really define that yet. Yeah. So ignorance is a mind that apprehends the I and my existing from its own sight without dependence. Yeah. I just told you the story in the restaurant. In Switzerland, when I as a little kid needed something, it was not on the menu, but I needed it now, and I came out. Right? Same if they ask you, please get angry, everybody, very difficult.
But if I talk about how you look or how you behave in an active way, then it's like, oh, that's going to say this to me. You know? Then anger comes up, right? You see? So it's related with this concept of self centeredness. Okay? And that self centeredness by itself is rooted in seeing that the I exists from its own side. I am mine. So, and when, you, when you get angry, sometimes it comes up. You have to get an experience how it comes up. Very strong mind of I, you know, that you want to protect. What you see is more important. You know? So, when, as somebody, when somebody criticizes you, very strong self defense. Mm -hmm. So, this self defense is based on seeing the I existing from its own side. Right? Same as the table, the things on the wall, the wall itself. We see existing out there, without dependence, right? But that's not reality. If you go on the quantum level, then there is no concrete from its own side existing table or wall or window. Even in quantum mechanics, they see there's nothing that sort as it appears, right? So same conclusion. That how things appear and how things actually exist is two different things. So that's why we shouldn't believe always what appears to us. Yeah, so, to go in, in more depth, and you see things appear very concrete, existing without dependence. Also, the I, how dare this person say this to me? I'm more important. I need this pizza. I need this phone. I need this. So, at that time, a very concrete sense of I appears. Also, when you almost dying, you experience almost dying, or not? In an accident or something. <laughs> I once experienced, uh, but at that time I didn't recognize because I was not really interested in these things. When I was a university student, we hitchhiked to a place called San Sebastian. It's kind of north of Spain at the coast, very very touristy place. And the records we put I have many records with uh, hitchhiking. Isn't hitchhiking. So now it's more difficult in Europe because you know criminality and danger of all different things. But in those days it was very easy to hitchhike in Europe. So then from the Netherlands to the north of Spain, which you have to cross Belgium and France, to complete countries, before you reach Spain. You know? So then, <laughs> uh, with my friends, we were very lucky because we had very few good lifts. We spent only five guildens on the whole trip, which is maybe, what is it? Uh, that will be at the moment uh, three euro, which is, what is it, 220. 220 uh, rupees, right? So that's quite a distance for 220 in Europe, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, so then we went to this beach, and there's like, oh, a nice beach, you know? But nobody was swimming. We thought, why? So <laughs> we went into the water, and then there was this, you know, on the currents, right? So it took my legs, and I didn't know it was up and down anymore. You know? Sand everywhere, and, you know, the, the ocean sea with sand, so then it's like the air strong fear, or oh, die. But luckily there was a wave and I could climb up the wave and went to the shore. So otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here. You know, so, but you can see at that time very strong I came up. You know? Or when you imagine you fall from a high building or you imagine you were in a free fall out of a plane. But then the, the parachute is there but doesn't open. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> you can imagine or you need a plane and there's kind of uh, turbulence and you think oh are we going down? You know? Then the fear arises, right? So that very strong I comes. You know? And that's very important to recognize that I. Not that you have to you know that you have to start uh, going on the edges of high buildings or something like that. But uh, <laughs> or do free falls or something. I don't advise you to do that, but uh, but uh, yeah, then it comes up. But you can practice in other ways. If not a person scolds you, says something nasty to you, if maybe it's true or maybe it's not true, it doesn't matter. Instead of reacting, you say, okay. oh, how does it appear? <laughs> so you say, okay, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry, yeah, sorry. And then you just walk away and then you hide yourself in the toilet or something. See <laughs> how the eye appears. Because that's very rare to see how does the eye appear. And then check if it exists the way it appears. Because in those occasions, you can learn so much. You know? So you don't have to disappear in a cave or something like that. You can, in daily life, learn so much. So, if you see how the eye appears, and then reason if it exists the way it appears or not, that's the question, right? So, uh, 
as we see, our body and mind is momentarily changing, right? Yeah, so it's kind of, if you just go from the tip of your toes to your whole body, to the crown of your head, all the organs, all the different bones, all the different, uh, you know, aspects uh, in your body, there's nothing that exists from its own side within this collection, right? Right. And there's nothing that exists all by itself, separated from the body. Right? So also with the mind, same thing. If you, just, if you check that your consciousness from the early morning, or just coming here, 6 o'clock, having the cake, and then sitting here and discuss things. <laughs> you know? So, uh, it's like, it's like a whole moment of consciousness. Or you listen, yeah? so there's some consciousness, or you see something, or you smell the cake, and taste the cake. You know? So, there are so many different types of consciousness since we started up to now, right? With different objects we saw, or we, we you know, apprehended, as we say. So there's a kind of a flux of different forms of, of mind in which that flux we cannot say, oh, the concrete I is here, or the concrete I am mine, which appears when I get angry, is here. We cannot find it, right? right? It's like a, 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 if you have, uh, you know, mountains, you have a lake, and you have a river, you know, like that. So, if you see the river, the water in the river, H2O molecules go down, right? Then where is the river actually? Because the, the water molecules you, you see, before you know it, they're in the, in the lake, right? On the ocean. ocean. Yeah, ocean or lake, whatsoever. You know? So that means that it's just a temporary thing. You say, oh, this is what we label or name a river, but actually, if you look for it, where is it? You see that? You can relate to that. So, that aspect, what we call dependent origination, that things are merely imputed by the mind. Nothing exists all by itself. You see that? So in our body and mind, we can check the eye appears very concrete from its own side. But when you get angry, or again, uh, attachment arises, or all forms of afflictions, you know, and some centeredness comes, it's a very concrete eye and mind that appears. You know? But actually, if you look, you cannot find it. So it's a very interesting meditation to do, to see, does it really exist the way it appears? Okay, so, we saw that uh, it's the root cause for the destructive emotions to arise, right? With anger, I comes up and then you get angry. Attachment, I comes up and you get attached, right? So, then we see that, so if you can take away this aspect of ignorance, then afflictions will not arise, right? So that's why the Swami's Dalai Lama says, if you, on a regular basis, like 16 times a day or something, you reflect on this interdependence of body and mind and situations around us, you know, then it looks like the fish is on the rise. Because that concrete aspect of reality is not present. Yeah, so, attachment, anger, jealousy, pride, these things, my, this, that person, that situation, exists all from its own side. That's how it appears, right? That's how it appears. But it doesn't exist in a way, you know? So if you understand it doesn't exist in that particular concrete way, as it looks like, then these destructive emotions will lose their potential. So that proves, if you contemplate these aspects of dependent origination, of body, mind, the persons around us, our environment, you know, then this concrete aspect of reality will fall away. So that means, uh, if you understand that aspect well, then because that concrete, as that concrete thing of reality will not be that evident anymore, so then these destructive emotions lose their potential. Is it that? Yeah. So that's that's the real kind of uh, true cessation, right? It's if you can eliminate this ignorance, you will eliminate destructive emotions. If you eliminate destructive emotions, there is no suffering. So the root cause here. Ignorance is being taken away. If you take away ignorance, you can take away all afflictions together with the causes, right? Or the roots. And then you can achieve what's called Nirvana. So that's kind of what we are the, in the third level, right? When the Buddha says you should manifest through cessation. Right? So that's based on these kind of principles of logic that things can be done. 
right? So sometimes, so the Buddha said, okay, you have a problem, right? And you know the cause of the problem, and you know if it's possible or not to solve the problem. Then, if that's true, then question number four will come, which is how, right? So that's the methods for the true paths. Yeah, the Buddha said the true paths. So the Buddha said you should, you know, when we just started, the Buddha said you should know suffering. You should uh, eliminate the cause of suffering. You should manifest the true cessation, and you should meditate on the true paths, right? Which are actually the true methods leading towards the true cessation. Yeah, so no truth for number four creates no truth number three, and no no truth number two creates no truth number one, right? So the cause of suffering creates suffering. The true paths creates the true cessation. So it's related, right? Those two. Yeah. So then the Buddha said you should meditate on true paths. So what I said here is a very simplified aspect of the Four Noble Truths, but it goes to is the direction of if you have understanding of reality, what we classify as emptiness. Empty of what? Empty of inner existence. Yeah, we just said things don't exist from their own side. Yeah, so and that absence we classify as emptiness. Empty of something. Yeah, emptiness doesn't mean sunyata, no, we say, right? So emptiness doesn't mean nothingness. Empty of something, right? So it means empty of what? Empty of inherent existence. Empty of, you know, things appear without dependence, but actually it's empty of that. Because everything is in the nature of dependence, right? Yeah, so the same true in, 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 in quantum physics, they come to the same conclusion, right? Everything is empty of concrete existence, because nothing exists concrete all by itself. Yeah. If you look at the subatomic particles, it's more, in, it's more important to know the relationships between subatomic particles than the individual particles by themselves, right? In order to understand what's going on. You know, so that means that this dependent origination or interdependence is, is extremely important. Yeah, so that's what the Buddha said. So if you have a kind of direct understanding of that, you know, the ultimate nature of reality, then we talk about the true parts. And if you have that true part, it will establish true cessation. Right? So then you can take away the cause for suffering. Right? So, so there's four noble truths and the Buddha took that into account of suffering, yeah, because when I said the Buddha moved out of compassion, you will eliminate the wrong views, you teach her of the sublime Dharma to go down Buddha and pay homage. Yeah, we started with that quotation. So that means the Buddha saw suffering, right? As we just then said, you should know suffering. Yeah. And then he, he said, you should know the cause of suffering. Right? Same if you have a doctor, you have a sickness, you go to the doctor, okay, what's the nature of the sickness? First question. Next question, what is the cause of the sickness? Right? Then the third, third question will be, is it possible to get cured or not? Right? And then the fourth question will be, what is the treatment? Same thing. Yeah. So the Buddha told that. So I ex explain that because when you want to generate compassion, you should understand this aspect of suffering, right? If you wish all sentient beings to be free of suffering. So that's why suffering and the cause of suffering, technically speaking, is twofold. Yeah, I only talked about afflictions, but generally speaking, is twofold. It's kind of afflictions and karma. Yeah, so uh, afflictions are the destructive emotions, so to say. Karma is not something magical. Karma is kind of causality within the continuity of consciousness, right? So we have an external form of causality, like the trees and the plants and you know uh, the things of the building, how things came about. But also we have an internal form of cause and effect, which we call karma. Right? So one aspect, simple aspect of karma, is that uh, a state of anger or a mental factor, as we call it, anger, causes suffering, right? Because the mind to be disturbed. Yeah, so that's also cause and effect relationship. You see that? Because anger is being classified as a non-virtuous mental factor. Non-virtuous is being defined as that which produces suffering. Right? So that's also an aspect of karma. Yeah? So then the suffering, we just went over a few aspects of suffering. Uh, and the cause of suffering now I explained two. Yeah? So, True being, calm and afflictions, that's the cause of suffering, right? And the root cause of suffering is this ignorance, as we discussed, right?
right? So as long as you get that picture clear, then we have enough for tomorrow to go into more depth. And then the suffering itself, because if you visual sense you need to be free of suffering, then you have to know that, right? So there's different levels of suffering. We have the suffering of suffering, like a headache, you know, or cold, or fever. We have the suffering of change. Yeah, so if you're hungry, you eat, but then you eat too much, and then it turns into another aspect. <laughs> or it's too hot, you stand in the shade, it gets too cold, you want to go in the sun again. You know, there's the suffering of change. Yeah, so, and then there's all pervasive, this very long term, all pervasive compounding form of suffering. So that's when the Buddha said you should know suffering, he said you should know this one. Because it's very easy to recognize a headache as a headache, or you know, when it's too cold you stand in the sun, and when it's too hot you go to the shade, right? So that's easy to understand. So when the Buddha said you should know suffering, he didn't mention these two. He said the all pervasive compounding form of suffering. Yeah, so that means as long as we have karma and afflictions, there's no escape. This was always sitting on the surface, you know, the cause of, of suffering. For sickness, same thing. You know, in Tibetan, we have a very good term. It says, Lenyon Chen Wan Chen. It means uh, by the power uh, of beyond control. Like a sickness just happens to us, right? Or depression, or. Of course, it's causes and conditions, but it's beyond our control initially. Especially physical sickness, right? It just happens to us. So that comes by the power of these karmic. Causes like karma and afflictions, right? So as long as we have these karma and afflictions, then it's just underneath the surface, so it just needs to be triggered by particular conditions. Like if you have a seed of a plant, you put it on the table, nothing will happen. But if I put it in a, in a pot with earth and fertilization, heat, moisture, it will grow. So for the same thing, underneath the surface, in our continuum of consciousness, there's this karma and you know combined with afflictions, so that can be triggered. And can ripen, right? So then, yeah, things can happen. You know? So that's from a positive point of view and from a negative point of view. Yeah? So we can experience happiness or suffering. Yeah? So that's to make the picture complete for today. And uh, yeah, so then the Buddha said you should know suffering, you should know this all pervasive compounding form of suffering, very essential. And uh, yeah, so we can talk about more tomorrow, but then you have to clean picture. So when the Buddha said, when Nagarjuna said, you moved out of compassion, yeah, so then the Buddha generated this kind of compassion for the benefit of all sentient beings, right? And those three levels, and then mainly thinking, I will cause them to be free of suffering. And so the Buddha saw suffering, understood suffering, understood the cause of suffering, and then generated a wish for us to be free of suffering, and then generated this compassion. So that's how we can generate a similar type of compassion. And to relate that, so we will discuss more tomorrow, with the attitude of, of working in a constructive way, try to help self and others to generate this compassion. Right? And that's then related also with the view of the ultimate reality. Because we saw that ignorance is the root cause of suffering. So if you understand the ultimate reality in more depth or detail, then not only will you be able to eliminate suffering yourself, but also eliminate suffering of others. Right? So that's uh, what's planning to talk about tomorrow. Until eight, right? Yeah. Today. Yes. Yeah. So I thought maybe if there's any questions, yeah, then if there's questions, feel free to ask. I have more most of the time. I like question answer sessions more than actually the, the talk. <laughs> yeah. Any questions? Yeah. 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 What is Corey's confession? No, no. And then the words in hand, yeah. the layman term, how do you yeah. it? In hand, they can be very short. But <laughs> yeah, so inherent means without dependence. Right? All by itself. That's the meaning of inherent. Or intrinsic. Some people translate it as intrinsic. It yeah, means without dependence, all by itself. So nothing exists in that way. Right? But it appears to exist in that way. Our problems are all by themselves. Or the I we just talked about all exists by itself. You know, but it appears that way. But actually you cannot find it in that way. You know, if you check your body or check your mind, 
There's no place for something that exists all by itself. You know, even David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, if you met Buddhism or not, it's a big debate, but he was kicked out of the <laughs> University of Edinburgh when he was 20 because his views were a little bit different. And so it was not mainstream kind of uh, thing. But anyway, so then uh, he went to the University of Paris and he wrote a book, and in that book, uh, Nature of Humankind, there's one chapter, The Identity of the Self, a very striking one, he says. He says, I cannot speak for others, but if I speak for myself, subjective way, then there's an eye that appears, very concrete, existing from its own side. But if I look for it, I cannot find it. Objectively, it doesn't exist. Yeah, so ultimately, if you look for it, it doesn't exist, right? Yeah. Because the eye appears very concrete when you get angry or somebody criticizes you, and appears to be existing, or it appears in a way without dependence, right? It appears to be all by itself, as a controller. Be in charge, without dependence, you know. But if you look within body and mind, you cannot find something like that. So actually it doesn't exist. We just believe it exists. That's the problem. So <laughs> it's very funny because uh, it's there since the beginning of lifetime. And we believe in it so much. It's caused all the problems, but actually it doesn't exist. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's very interesting. There's something that doesn't exist, but we believe it exists. It's caused all the problems. Very interesting. It's just one other example I give you to relate to more that everything is just merely imputed by the mind. For example, uh, now also in Bangalore you see a lot of fancy cars, right? So take BMW or Mercedes or whatever. Uh, so you're going to buy a new fancy car. So you look in all the showrooms and there's one showroom with, like say, 10 identical cars. All the same type, like, let's say BMW or take, take one. Or uh, La Lamborghini or Ferrari, whatever. You know, ten identical cars. There's a boy coming inside the showroom, throwing stones at all the cars, right? And you say, oh, that's not nice, right? You react like that, that's not nice. Then, on another occasion, you, you plan to buy one of those cars, right? One of the ten. So, <laughs> you put your signature down for the payments, for the installments, over a couple of years. The same thing happened, the boys, boy comes in and throws stones in all those 10 cars, but one of them is yours, right? You re react completely different than before, right? The car is exactly the same, the boy is exactly the same. The car didn't change, right, in the way in relation with the other cars, but your, your view was, is completely changed. Because now one of those cars is my car, and this boy is throwing the stone on my car. And then, you see, exactly, it's just a mere imputation by signing the contract. The car is exactly the same, but just your relationship mentally with the car is changed. And that causes the problem, you see? So very interesting. Yeah, regarding your... So, things appear to exist from its own side, but actually, if you look, there's nothing like that, you see? So that's kind of inherent existence. It appears to exist from its own side, but it's not. Yeah, so that's your first question. Then the second question regarding courageous compassion. So we first start with the general type of compassion, right? As we just discussed, to, to generate a wish for all sentient beings to be free of suffering. Yeah. And the more you train your mind in that way, it can become a very courageous one. Yeah. As long as Dalai Lama has this kind of willpower to work for the benefit of all sentient beings, you know, to bring harmony amongst religions, you know, to work for the Tibetan case, to, to lead all, all individuals to more understanding of the Dharma, right, to do something for the Tibetan culture. Uh, and then when the Chinese, especially when he just came, uh, like he, there were some threats from the Chinese authorities. And then the Dalai Lama said, oh, if they kill me in this life, I will just continue my next life. <laughs> you see, that's a courageous kind of attitude. That's what we're talking about. So the more you train your mind, in seeing the benefits of working for the, you know, for the welfare of others to eliminate them suffering, that becomes a very strong mind. You know? And that's a kind of courageous attitude. Yeah. Tomorrow we can talk about more, but yeah, that's kind of a little bit ideal. Because this mind, and another thing, uh, maybe interesting to know, is uh, in India maybe less, but in the West there's a lot of issues with post-traumatic stress disorder. I always think Indians are more relaxed. 
then the Western person, people, people in the West say, well, no Westerners are here, right? Yeah. Don't share my recording with be my friends in the <laughs> Europe, okay? <laughs> anyway, you know, uh, may I told it also once. Uh, that, yeah, Westerners, I, I myself was Western, so I can say that. <laughs> They're more individualistic and more, so, you know, a lot of I is, is more important than social media. I, I mean, how it's influencing India as well, right? So that means that because there's more concrete concept of I am important, right? All the social media is just fueling on that. You know? So based on that attitude, when something happens to you in a physical way, also mentally there's an issue. So that means that there are post-traumatic stress disorders when something happens to an individual, right? Yes, on top of the physical problem. So in Tibet, yeah, it's almost time. <laughs> yeah, so in Tibet, in occupied Tibet, you know, when the Chinese, uh, uh, yeah, you know what happened, right? So don't have to explain. But then in, in, in certain types of prison, prisons, people were tortured. You know, for not for a year, but for years. So they come out of the prison after decades, sometimes, and physically they have issues with electric shocks, and you know they have to be treated. But mentally, it's been researched by by uh, Daniel Brown from Harvard Medical School that almost none, of course, there's few cases there, but the majority of the Tibetans who come out of this uh, indoctrination in the prison, there's no post-traumatic stress disorder. Very interesting. Because of this courageous compassion, because they understand the situation, they understand they cannot do anything, they understand that the, the Chinese officials, they, they, you know, they're motivated out of ignorance, out of afflictions, and do that. Because the real problem is not the individual, the real problem is, is the afflictions in the minds, right? So understanding that aspect is a very strong mind, you know, and that can go to extend of very courageous attachment, or sorry, very courageous compassion. It even goes to the extent of when they get executed, they say to the executor, please give me a few seconds, I make a prayer. And they make a prayer for the person who is executing them, saying, oh, they never really uh, have to experience the result of the act. Very interesting. So that's the kind of compassion that goes beyond our ordinary kind of day-to-day -day kind of view of the world, because we're very short-sighted, most of us, right? We think about years, we don't think about lifetimes. Yeah. So the antidote, like I is also an ego, right? Yeah. 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 So one of the antidote, that is courageous compassion, where we they also prevent physical mm. disorders like mm. stuff. Yeah, and because zero. Yeah. Because it's all rooted in this concrete concept of I am I, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Tomorrow we can talk more. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that is very important to contemplate. In the, in the West, in Europe, there's a movement called Dead Cafe, where all people, uh, people were dying, but also people were just getting old. They come together and talk about, the, you know, losing family members and friends, and to at least bring more awareness. Because death is going to happen to all of us, right? So if you just don't like to think about it, and when you face it, it's very difficult. So that's why it's very important to prepare it. So that's, in all aspects of reality, if you understand it, acceptance is there. Yeah? So, in that way, it's very essential to build up awareness, awareness building in community, right? Because then you can help. I always, put, always give the example of my own mother, uh, who doesn't call herself Buddhist or something, but her son is walking around like this, and she met with his holiness, so she's reading things about Buddhism, right? So then when my father had lung cancer and within a few months he passed away. But then my family members and aunts and uncles they thought, oh my mother probably will go into depression for months because they were very good I mean reasonably good very good relationship uh, and always together and then all of a sudden the partner falls away, right? But then 
Very interesting. Of course, sadness was there, but the depression didn't happen. Because then I asked her later on, I said, what happened, you know? <laughs> so then also the doctor said, he was, he was really impressed how my mother was dealing with this issue, right? No need to, to talk too much with people. So just with our mind, could figure it out. You know? So then she told me, she said, yeah, I was thinking about these things already for quite some time. You see? So that's, that's, that's helping so much. If you understand that reality, then you face it, acceptance is there, and you can move on. That's what my mother, my mother says. Okay, yeah, that's it, sadness was there, missing, but life has to carry on, right? Very interesting. And she became more social, and more activity, you know, to, to break the, the, the silence, right? Yeah, very interesting. Yeah? Self-care will be the, will affect you, you suppose. If Which one? Self-care. Yeah, self-care, huh? So, will affect you, with just uh, not to think about, uh, like, if you think about, uh, if you have selfless attitude, mm -hmm. the self care will affect. Is is mm -hmm. my question? Because I see some. I mean, I see from my example, uh, my experience that uh, mm -hmm. we will actually lose some self care if if you more if you're not uh, if you are very self uh, selfless attitude yeah. you're developing. Is it right or? Yeah, I mean, in, 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 if you know the real context, then there's no no faults. But if you're quite new to this material, then those questions will come up. And that's why also self-care in the sense of this terminology in, in, in these kind of fields of the scientific findings around, around compassion training is self-compassion, that's one term, right? So that means that, of course, you have to take care of certain things in your, in your only life, right? Because it's true, when we are very tired or, you know, when things don't go well, it's easier to get emotional. Well, when the mind is more settled and peaceful, you know, it's easier to do constructive thinking. Yeah. So that's why we have to put some effort into that direction in order to be a benefit for self and others, right? So that's what we call self-care. So that's why in, in the Buddhist teachings of the stage of part of life, it's the same thing. First you understand the suffering of samsara, then you generate a wish to be free of that, and then you generate a wish for others to be free of that, right? So it's the same kind of pattern, you see? Because if you don't have subdued your own mind, how can you help others to subdue their minds, right? Yeah, so. But the self-care in that context should be seen not as a selfish attitude, but as an attitude to constructively move forward for self and others. Right? And that becomes a real, real, the right kind of self-care, or the right form of self-compassion. Because if the self-care or self-compassion becomes kind of self-centered, then, of course, you don't really accomplish the goals even for yourself. That's why as long as Dalai Lama says, if you want to be selfish, be selfish in an intelligent way. So that means if you think about others and not only about yourself, there's more benefit. If you only think about yourself and not about others, then it's the wrong form of being selfish because that causes more suffering. You see? So if you think about others as well, then it generates a very constructive way of happiness for self and others, right? Yeah, you see that? Yeah, and also, Many people misunderstand that when you practice patience or something like that, and people think, oh, you just let do people whatever they like. That's not, that's not the issue. Because even with a mind in full, you know, in control, so to say, without getting angry or irritated, we can still say and do things, right? How we act for, a, you know, teaching a child to, you know, not to misbehave. You can even do something and say, and inside no anger, but be very direct. You know, so we can act, so a teacher in school, or manager in, 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 in the team, you know, we can say things very directly, but inside there's no anger or aversion, there's, inside, there's only good motivation to benefit, you see that? So you can really act if you want to. If you meet his holiness in private, it's very direct, very direct. Or even in public. I've been at a few conferences or public talks when there's so much for formalities, and I don't mention where, but... <laughs> <laughs> so many formalities and it took hours and hours and I was just thinking, oh man. And then his owners came to speak and said, too much formality, waste of time. <laughs> very direct, but very compassionate. Because if you waste our time with these things, then, you know, there's, there's no constructive moving forward, you know. So that means inside there's no irritation, but kind of, you know, a message come true because we have to move forward, right? You see that? Yeah. yeah. So I think adding what he said, being what he said was. 
Yeah. Too much of a selfless attitude. Yeah. How much of it impacts self care? Yeah. Right? You tend to yeah. put yourself last all the yeah. time. Where do you draw the line? Yeah. And where do you know, where is mm. the balance? Yeah. So the balance is in the in the in the area of make sure it doesn't go to the self centeredness or self importance, right? But on a conventional level, if somebody does something incorrect, you have to correct that person. Right? So then you can say something or do something. Right? But make sure when you take action, make sure there's no irritation from your side, but a motivation to benefit both both both, both sides, right? And then you can then you can act very directly with school teachers or, or parents to the children, you can be quite direct. Yeah, but make sure there's no irritation because if irritation takes over, destruction takes destructive emotion takes over, and then we lose the control to clearly think and we might make the wrong decision. Yeah? So the real self-care is in this kind of neutral aspect of the mind to keep your mind at peace but act. Yeah? Yeah? Uh, yeah. Yeah? Then we stop and then we make a few dedications. So it's always good to uh, to generate correct motivation and then we talk about things and then we try to dedicate. Yeah? The, the, yeah, we don't have to read. We can just... I tell you how to think and then you just make a prayer. It's more important than just to recite in words. Yeah? So try to think that uh, what we talked about today, that we pray for and dedicate our good things we did today for the benefit of self and others to quickly achieve these correct understandings of the mind, yeah? of the four noble truths as we discussed, and compassion and reality. Yeah? So try to think in those uh, lines that oneself and all others may generate understandings of these important aspects of life, as well as the realizations, the innate aspects of it as well. Yeah, so try to dedicate. Uh, yeah, those who are Buddhists, we refer to them as the three principal aspect of the part. Yeah, so, and others might be able to generate them. Yeah. Tony Tower in Bochy, my dear Pana, you give you. Also, try to dedicate uh, that all the, you know, the spiritual leaders like His Holiness Dalai Lama uh, have a long and healthy life, and all the holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. It's also important to pray for. Gare, Rabe, Gore, Zingonzo, Penda, Dewa, Mare, Jungwe, Cheri, Zigwan, Tenzin, Yanzoi, Shabbe, Shede, Mado. Okay, thank you very much.